Yo, what's good? I just wrapped up a podcast with Rodney Evans. Rodney, Rodney's an interesting guy. He started Central Studios back in, I believe he said it was uh, 2009. Yeah, because it's their 10 year anniversary coming up this Sunday, June 23rd. You can stop by Central Studios to go check out their um, annual fair day. Uh, it was super great to have Rodney on. He has a lot of experience in the creative industry. Um, he's been living in Shanghai for 10 years. He's from Australia. A lot of cool stuff went down. Please give it up for Rodney Evans. In the land of China, people hardly got nothing at all. No possessions? And in China, they never go to church. No religion, too? Very good man. Well, it's easy if you try, Dick. Two, one. Okay, we're live. Hey, Rodney, how are you doing? Thank you for coming over. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, thank you so much for PushFest. That went so well. Thank you for all your help with that. No, it's a pleasure. It's <laughs> always great to have uh, have the crew down. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year was a was a pretty special event, actually. A different format without mm -hmm. the skate ramp. Yeah. Uh, but people were pretty skating crazy anyway. So Yeah, we always managed <laughs> to use the wall ride this year. Like everyone just gravitated towards that because it's just so natural to go and skate your big psych. Yeah, I must have had a bit of foresight when building the studio to make sure the site was concrete. <laughs> mm. So we were working at, you know, construction techniques and having shot in a few studios before we we, we built it. Mm. Uh, I'd seen far too many kind of humidity warped cycloramas. Oh, really? Yeah, a lot of people build them out of wood or cheap uh, mm. plasterboard. And with the, with the fluctuations of the weather here in Shanghai, they just kind of get all out of whack. Mm. So I was like, I just want some nice concrete. And and then when we opened the first event we ever had was a Nike skateboarding event. Right. So, you know, literally like our brand new studio, two weeks after we, we opened the doors, Nike were in there with their mm. SB, uh, it's a rap film. And, mm. uh, it had them, you know, I was like, yeah, go for it. Skate the psych. <laughs> That's so, awesome. So it's kind of like christened, christened with a skateboarding event. So we've always felt uh, a bit of a, a bit of a bonding with, with the skate community and always happy to have, uh, have them down and, mm. uh, you know, from, from Vans, House of Vans to Push Fest and uh, it's been nice. Awesome. Uh, for people who don't know, can you tell them a little bit about Central Studios and what it is here in Shanghai? Sure. Uh, well, Central Studios is primarily a photo studio. Mm. Uh, we're just a couple of blocks south of Shintendi and we have a thousand square meters in the ground floor of an old sock factory. And it's an old sock factory. Sock factory. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. It's like, you know, the Shangtex, like number nine West, <laughs> you know, sock factory. And across the road was the t-shirt factory. And wow. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting to think that there were factories in the heart of Shanghai maybe not even like 15 years ago. Yeah, this whole area. I mean, when I first arrived, I remember going down, there was just full of these old kind of like block, they're all cookie cutter warehouse buildings, huh. right? They've got the same thing. They've got a six by six grid of columns. And and uh, so a lot of them have been knocked down. Hmm. And in the early days, there were a lot of uh, smaller studios around and creative businesses. Really? And, you know, we, when we moved in, we had a woodworking factory upstairs. They were like had this one of those big, nasty redwood furniture mm. places upstairs. So we literally had sawdust coming down uh, through, through the roof. <laughs> Trickling through yeah, the roof. Yeah, they, no they, they had a gantry off the side of the building and they had like little crane like lowering over our front door and stuff. Mm. So. But the uh, landlord got them out and redid it and uh, had a, you know, they've kind of upgraded the whole building. So, but, but we're a studio and, um, you know, first and foremost, uh, a studio uh, where people come to shoot. Mm. Uh, we have photo, photo shoots, video shoots, uh, magazines, a lot of celebrities. Uh, we're also a production company, a creative company. So we do a lot of work for other, other companies. And uh, we are a, a venue. We're open to having events down at mm. the studio. So we love seeing all kinds of brand events or community events uh, happening there. So it's a bit of a hub. Mm, a bit of a hub. Yeah, there's so much to talk about. Before we get into that, I actually wanted to to dive into, you're from Sydney, is that correct? Correct. So you you grow, grew up in Sydney. Can you tell me about life grow, growing up in Sydney a little bit? Uh, life growing up in Sydney? Uh, well, I've been thinking a lot about that lately because I've got a six-year-old boy mm. and uh, I compare kind of, you know, life growing up in Shanghai, what it would be like for him. Right, because he's what, going through so, he's so many very, things that you're seeing in front of your eyes right now. And it's now. great. And, he, you know, he handles it all and, and he loves Shanghai and it's his home and we go away. He loves coming back to Shanghai. And But uh, but 
comparing to what we we grew up in, like parks and beaches. And, mm. you know, I mean, I remember as a kid when I was his age, we'd go down to Bondi Beach and park and leave the windows down, the doors unlocked and go to the <laughs> beach for the day. That's you just know. the lifestyle well, down yeah, there. Yeah, well, you know, back in the, the early mid-70s and then people just really weren't that worried about mm. security like that. And then well, slowly as we grew up, the windows kind of got rolled up and the really? doors got locked and, you know, it was always a bitch getting back into the car after the day at <laughs> the beach. But uh, it was it was a good lifestyle. I mean, pretty carefree. We had the harbour on one side and the beaches on the other. And then Beautiful place. as I kind of went through high school and, you know, some friends had boats and we'd kind of either after school go down to the beach or weekends we were all living on the harbour and just bouncing around. It was pretty pretty dreamy compared mm. to kind of this urban con- yeah massive completely different density yeah so um i'm familiar with sydney i studied in the gold coast for about six months amazing times nice. Bruce vegas I, uh, <laughs> yeah um they call it like the miami of uh, australia because like you kind of a lot of people go down there to retire or it's a bunch of like kids on schoolies you know just having a good time but i made it down to sydney a couple times um i'm curious like where you were because when I was there, I remember Manly Beach and I remember Bondi Beach. So what was like your beach that you were Bondi. 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 So we beach. were literally like, uh, you know, a 10-minute walk to Bondi Beach. Wow, that's a dream. Yeah. So we grew up in Belvey Hill, which is kind mm. of the next suburb in. And uh, we sort of had a view to the harbour on one side and a view down to the beach on the other. Mm. And uh, so, um, yeah, Bondi was the local. Wow. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Um, Bondi Beach. So you, you said you were swimming a lot there and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, God, Bondi Beach, it's just such a, a such a central part of of I guess it was definitely a central part of, of my upbringing and uh and my life in Sydney. Mm. Uh, you know, either from from being a young kid to being a teenager to to even going through university and beyond. Um I never lived far from Bondi Beach and uh you know, as kids, we'd sort of go down there as teenagers in, you know, packs of guys looking for packs of girls and hmm. sort of hanging down the beach and or going out to Ben Buckler on the rocks when the, when the swirl was in and trying to stand out there as long as possible before getting wasted by a massive wave. And Yeah, I you know, see getting, some of the videos down there and people yeah. are just, it's a different breed of people that can like swim. I get so nervous, like thinking about getting thrashed around in the rocks. So you you grew up as an ocean man. Did you surf at all or did you? No, I was never, I'm never really a big surfer, sadly. And, mm. and and never really a big surfer and never really a big skater. But uh, mm. it's kind of been one of my envies and that, that little bit uh, dejected that I, that I never really took it up hmm. uh, seriously. Yeah, but I love the waves and I love a body bash and you know, yeah. I love the feeling of like swimming out and catching a wave and mm. feeling the power of the wave of course. with nothing between you and, and, and the ocean and you just come, you know, thundering down the front of a wave and yeah. getting ahead of it. It's, it's quite a special feeling. Definitely. So um, growing up in Sydney, I wanted to get into your professional life. I know you're you're a creative. That's what I look at you as, as just a creative person. So, but before that, how did you find that part of you? Like what kind of jobs were you doing leading up to being a creative? Like even like your first job. What was your first job? So, I guess back in high school, we had the opportunity to do work experience mm. where one or two weeks a year you get to choose a a, a company or a job and go and work in that sure, job. Sure. So, I chose to spend uh, my work experience with the photography department at the Sydney Morning Herald Mm. and I'd always liked photography and uh, I chose to do that but then sadly in our final year of high school we can you can kind of choose your your final two years you get to choose a couple of subjects for your high school certificate in Australia Mm. and you know you invariably what happens is you do one subject for a year and then you drop that subject and go up a level in other subjects and it balances out to get a number of units. And, and I kind of wanted to do uh, one unit photography, Mm. which, which kind of was arguably a bit of a throwaway year when, when um, compared against the academic stakes of modern history. Yeah. And uh, my parents were saying, well, no, you need to do a proper subject like modern history. So I did modern history and that was interesting too. Uh, But, I, ne- I never got to do the art course, mm. uh, so it kind of got a little bit buried. And then um, I went through university and graduated. Uh, gradu- sorry, graduated high school and wanted to do law, and I narrowly missed out on the on the entrance mark to law. So I thought I'd do arts for a year and then mm. and then and then swap out to law. And I realised after about sort of six weeks of university that I really didn't want to be there. And I just, I just finished high school and I just, my head wasn't ready to settle down and study and stuff. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a year off. And, uh, 
I uh, had to, um, you know, endure a couple of sessions with the university counsellor to put my parents' mind at ease that this was okay to do. Mm. And uh, then we, um, I decided to do hospitality. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, so I swapped out and, and the following year went back and did a Bachelor of Commerce with a hospitality major and, and kind of w- then worked in hotels for the next five years. So Throughout, uh, Australia? In or? Australia, yeah. And for your gap year, did you leave Australia at all or did you stay in Australia? No, I stayed. I just started working. Hmm. So Just like odd jobs, you know? Um, I got a job in a restaurant. Okay, and, yeah. You know, I was, wasn't even 18 yet and I was kind of like working in a, in a, in a restaurant and stuff. Hmm. So once I, yeah. got, once I turned 18, I could then go and work in hotels. Right. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. I loved it. I love hospitality and, and still kind of deep down somewhere there's this latent fire that, that I'd love to do something in hospitality. Yeah. Um, catering or food, catering or food, something for me, I I actually am interested in hospitality as well. I always have like a little bit of an urge or a dream to maybe open up an Airbnb, like a very personalized situation. Like, so can you tell me about hospitality, like like a big hotel? What was the vibe like? Yeah, I was working at the Ritz Carlton for a couple of years and Park Lane and, uh, all the big brand hotels, Hmm. observatory hotel, like five-star hotels. And, Hmm. and it was a hospitality management course. So the, the, the idea they put you through something. Well, no, it's, you get your work experience separately, but the idea was that they were training the, the industry leaders of the future. And it was a pretty, pretty new course. And it was definitely the most advanced, um, professional management course mm. that was available at the time in Australia. Yeah. Uh, so I did that and then finished university and then went traveling and kind of had my gap year after university mm. and uh, was on travel. And the plan was to go to the Caribbean to play carnival in Trinidad with a bunch of mates. Really? And on the play way. Play carnival? What, is, what do you mean by that? Like uh, to to take part in carnival. So oh. we, we joined a band and had all the glittery, sequiny. So you, you play outfits. an instrument? Well, no, when you play carnival, it just means like you joined a band and you you just, you, you're in a oh, group. like a groupie? So, <laughs> well, it's 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 kind of, they call them bands and, and it's like. In, I'm not familiar with carnival at all. So, so every every uh, Caribbean island or in, in, in South America or Brazil, there's, they all have carnival at Mardi Gras. Okay, okay, so, Mardi Gras, yes. So it's basically a couple of days of dancing through the streets in mm. fancy costumes, just yeah. drinking and dancing and and uh, it's a good time. Hmm. So on my way over there, my appendix ruptured. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. So, so I ended on up, your way. Oh, so sorry. On, on your way. way. Oh, oh my, my God. And you're like, oh, wait, on a boat, on a plane? Like, no, I was on a plane. I was on a plane from LA to New York. And uh, I thought it was just the dodgy Mexican from the night before. <laughs> and my guts were started to pain. It was really painful. I thought, oh, look, I just got to go to the toilet. I'll be right. Mm. And uh, the pain didn't go away for two days and kind of mm. went into the hospital. And, mm. you know, a very expensive examination later. And oh, it's like the, the old finger push test. It's like, yeah, I think your appendix eruptured. I'm like, ah. And, and so then maybe um, this is in New York or? This is in New York. So if you could keep your mouth just close to the mic, that'd be, yeah. So it was in New York and uh, had to get my appendix removed, mm. emergency operation. So I was got down there and I was a little bit in recovery mode and not quite as fighting fit that I'd hoped. But it was a good time. So I did carnival, traveled around the Caribbean for, for a couple of months and then went back to New York and mm. uh, where I had a little kind of stash of cash in a bottom of a shoebox in my cousin's <laughs> apartment, which was, awesome. was like, where's that cash? You I'm out of cash. And, uh, and started working in a restaurant there. Okay. So you had a little bit of a life in New York. So I lived in New York for a year. And at the same time working in a restaurant, I mm. kind of bought a camera and was just going to 17th street and just taking photos and developing film and printing. When you say 17th street, is that for developing? Or no, is that it's a- where there are like a lot of black, uh, a lot of labs and developing labs oh, and okay. dark rooms and stuff. In the day, there were dark rooms. Photographer used to have dark rooms. Really? What's that? Yeah. What's a dark room? <laughs> it's a room with uh, like a row of computers and- uh, Oh, you had computers, of course. That makes no, sense now. Yeah, no. So trays of chemicals and paper and, mm. uh, and I just got into printing and I'd walk around the streets of New York taking photos and then go to the dark room and make prints. And it was a really nice experience. And I mm. got into photography and- and uh, one of my best mates from school also happened to be there with um, with his uh, partner at the time and uh, he wanted to be a musician. Mm. She wanted to be an actress. So we're all there. It's kind of, okay, well, what are we doing? We're chasing our dreams and we'd mm. go to parties and yeah. and his girlfriend at the time, she was very forward and she'd be like introducing all of us. Hi, I'm an actress. It's my boyfriend. He's a musician. He's my friend. He's a photographer. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, what kind of photography do you do? And I'm like, uh, black and white. <laughs> and uh, not really, didn't really know kind of what. What the, age is this right now? Oh, God, I must have been like 20, uh, 20, 23. 23 in New York. Yeah, yeah. We're figuring it out. 
Yeah, and and you know the the depths of professional photography. I had no idea, kind of mm. really, you know how deep and far the 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 craft went. Mm-hmm. So I did that for a while, did that for a year, and then went back to Australia. And uh, were you getting any clients in New York? No, or it was just like your your. It was figure, a hobby. It was my a hobby. job. My job was working in a restaurant. I was You're, just teaching myself. I te- was just shooting. I think that's how a lot of yeah. the best come to be. Like even myself. Um, and friends, like I didn't go to school for video. I went to school for marketing, but the stuff I do now is the stuff I love. And you're going to find out how to do that today. I have YouTube. Um, when you were like coming up, you might've had mates that you can go and ask and you go to the developing labs and there's more of a community. So I think that's pretty cool that like you were doing it. So we're, we're back in New York, you're figuring it out. And eventually you decide to move back to Australia. Yeah, it's pretty hard. Uh, it's pretty hard living in New York with a, with a restaurant wage and mm. kind of just trying to work out where I wanted to be. So, so after a year, I'm kind of like, you know what? I think I'm going to move back. And and uh, first day back, we're down at Bondi Beach again, sitting <laughs> sitting at sitting at Hugo's on the sidewalk. And you're with a your family sharp. at this time, or? Uh, well, I moved back uh, with my family, mm. but. Uh, uh, that particular day, I remember it clearly, it was with a mate just sitting there barefoot drinking a bottle of Chardonnay mm-hmm. overlooking Bondo Beach. And uh, I thought, well, this is a good life. You know, yeah. you don't, don't need too much money for this. Mm-hmm. And, and Sydney's like that. You can actually, although it's a bit more expensive these days, but you could kind of get by without um, needing a lot because the lifestyle is so great. Yeah. You know, a lot of outdoors. Mm-hmm. So at this point, you're, you're, you're settling back into Sydney. What's your, what's your thought process? Like, are you trying to get work or what's going on like for the future at this point? Yeah. So, so I just got back and obviously, you know, the big question is what now? Mm -hmm. And, uh, the first thing I did was just meet a whole lot of photographers and started assisting professionally. Mm. So I, um, started to get some, some real professional experience and it was a completely different thing to just going to the darkroom and printing and shooting. Mm. And that was great, all kinds of photographers, and uh, started studying a bit of photography uh, down and did a photography course. Um, didn't go back to university to, to do a degree. Mm. I um, I just couldn't really come to terms with the idea of studying again for another four years. I guess I'm just pretty poorly disciplined when it comes to that. You know what? I have thoughts on that, and I, I don't think it's about being poorly disciplined. I think each individual learns in a different way. For example, when I was in school, at like elementary school, I was put into something called resource room. Like people thought I had ADHD and that kind of stuff. But I think everyone learns so much. Some pe- some kids will learn better from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. You know, but everyone is put into this cookie cutter system where you have to wake up at eight or even seven, get to school by eight, and you're working all day until there's a one hour break and then you work the whole rest of the day. So I just think that's an interesting thing that, it's good to recognize that you don't need to go to the, the go down the traditional route. So you, you figured it out yourself and, and then you, you got into photography that way. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I spent about five years kind of, you know, vacillating between photography and hospitality. Mm. And, you know, again, you know, as a photo assistant, you know, even in Sydney, the life can be pretty hard. So you need to kind of be out there working and, mm. and earning some money on the side. Sure. So I'd work nights in a, in a cocktail bar and, and then daytime in, in a studio. Mm. And, and that was great because I got to kind of meet a lot of people around the city and industry people, both industry people. And, and you kind of get to know how things work. Mm. And, uh, it was, a, it was a really good period until I kind of got to the point, it was around the year 2000. I'm like, you know what? I think I'm done with hospitality. I'm just going to do photography full cool. time and got a little studio and um, just kind of set up a little business. And it was, it was just kind of like a little mixed business that did a bit of corporate, bit of fashion, sort of mm. commercial photography, all kinds of work and see what comes up. I wasn't really specializing in any one thing, but just mm. getting a really great uh, breadth of experience. Cool. What I'm really curious about is, so that's 2000 and right now we're in 2019, almost 20 years. So tell me about- Where did it go? <laughs> where did it go? Life- um, working in an like business life pre this crazy technology we have right now, I'm talking like even email, like, I mean, email I'm sure was big back then, but I know nothing about business in the early 2000s. So I'm, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit of like comparing the process of working with clients back then versus now. Mm. So when I was working uh, as a photographer in Sydney, it was right on the transition from film to digital. And, right, that, uh, that's a good thing to talk. So about. I was kind of right there at the coal face, and uh, and it's interesting. I guess you know, from the business perspective, I guess 
uh, clients had to learn what digital was about. Photographers had to learn right. what digital yeah, was about. Everyone's going so, to So, you know, I mean, the old days we'd do a shoot and it's like 10 rolls of film where you charge per roll of film. And, mm. you know, we used to make good margins on the oh, film. Oh, that's as how well. you would do it. You would just charge per roll of film. Well, no, you charge day rate and then you charge consumables and, you know, mm. you charge taxis to the line lab items. And, sure. Yeah. You but know, it was but, just, but, but was it all one. adds up. So yeah, you do, you're doing a big shoot with 20, 30, 50 rolls of film at 50 bucks a roll. You're making, you know, nice 50% margin on that it all sort of it all adds up um but uh but the business the technology uh transformation was really interesting and at the time I was uh I was kind of like on the on the board of the ACMP which is the Australian Commercial and Magazine Photographers Association and Mm. and it was a great way to kind of really get to get to know obviously some industry leaders but also be at, be at the front of that conversation mm. about um, copyright, about digital, about, you know, how how we ought to be running our businesses mm. as, as photographers. And uh, so early on I kind of made an investment into like an EOS 1DS, which was like the first full-frame DSLR and, you know, geared up on computer and learnt the workflow and the software and, you know. It's how an amazing the file time management. to start, like learning from ground Ground, like ground zero, whatever you want yeah. to call it. That's cool. That's so cool. so it's interesting because I do that. And so my methodology is very ordered. Even now, like, you know, when I'm just shooting my family pics, I kind of download it. I've got my folders and my file number. Got a workflow. I got my workflow and, and my, my kind of process is all set up. But like, you know, I see young kids come into the studio and they're just card dumping onto the desktop and it's like, <laughs> the you desktop. know, it's like underscore L54321 uh, dot JPG and it's like, dude, you're not shooting raw. What about the file renaming? What folder is this? And it's like. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I've seen you in action just kind of like lurking around and now I'm getting a better understanding of where you're coming from because you you have all this experience and you're seeing all these young guns come in here, do some cool things, but you have such a, a deeper understanding of what's going on. You know, I think in the days of film, like you just couldn't fuck up because, mm. you know, if you if you load the film wrong or you do a bad exposure and it's gone, the shoot's over. over. These days people can can work with a badly exposed file. Or mm. Even if you're shooting JPEG instead of RAW, sometimes there's a, you know, especially for social media, but, you know, sometimes, not matter at all sometimes there's media. a way you can, you, can, you can make things look all right. And uh, I think digital... You know, it, it saves a lot of bad photographers and just, you know, leaving it later. So the craft has changed. Hmm. You know, there's no need for the, for the craft anymore. It's like, hey, I can just take a photo and do the rest later or this is my look or, you know, these days with vloggers, you know, uh, you see it now with the influencers that they'll come with their own photographers and teams because that's their look and that's the way they like to right. shoot stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to comment whether or not it's good or bad craft, but the, but the point is that they can rely on, digital workflow or their own workflow to create their look and that's okay Mm. you know whereas back then uh when i was you know working shooting you know the turn of the century and uh the turn of the century it's got a nice ring to it doesn't it (laughs) so at the turn of the y2k and uh, so you know you had to kind of there was a certain standard Mm. that you had to deliver on yeah and high res files were high res files and you know it's it's like it was that way or no way or, or shit just wouldn't come out. But these days with printing and technology and people are getting away with a lot worse. Definitely. Just yesterday I had what you would call an influencer on the show. Her name is Kiki Yangs and she has her own look and she has her own manager and she she probably just works with photographers, whoever she wants. The process has changed so much. I want to get back to what you were saying. You started to work with the government um, of Australia. Is that correct? Or were you involved with him at all, like? Um, as a secret agent. Um, <laughs> no, for funding, because I'll have a follow-up no, question. No, so, so, look, yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's kind of, um, that was my segue into China. Yeah. Um, I had an opportunity to take part in an exhibition for Tourism Australia. Mm, right. That was touring through Asia. So uh, it, uh, I said, yeah. So how did you get involved with them? Because it got me thinking, this is an amazing opportunity for many young Australians or, you know, in China, I think any country does have a budget for a creative department, you know, for, for, Mm. um, funding people and people just don't know about it. So how Mm. did you come into this position? I guess I got on their radar through someone I knew was in the, uh, PR doing the PR, managing the PR account for Mm -hmm. Tourism Australia. And it was kind of her initiative to, to do this whole, uh, program throughout Asia. So it's about who you know? Uh, It's definitely a part of it, Mm. but, you know, the images were relevant and, uh, you know, it was part of the image of 
what they wanted. You know, I'd been driving at the time. I'd been driving around the country and shooting some landscape and, mm. you know, my own personal stuff. And, okay. And uh, so I guess building up a little bit of a portfolio of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So like it was pitched to you as like, you're going to go there and show your photos around Asia or what's up? Um, it was like, Hey, have you got some work? Can we see your landscape stuff? And mm -hmm. they were like, yeah, no, this is great. We want to include you in this show. Awesome. And, uh, it was with some other artists. It mm -hmm. wasn't just landscape photography. There was a painter and, uh, I think maybe a fashion designer and hmm. it was kind of like a bit of a mixed sort of show. And uh, it was Beijing, Shanghai, I guess the Philippines, Thailand, Singapore. A couple oh, of so others. this was a tour of Asia. Not yeah, but just I didn't. China. I only came to China. I mean, they were basically like, um, "Well, we're going to take your images." I'm like, "Great, we fly me there." They're like, "No." So oh, you didn't get to. They didn't get flown. No, I didn't get flown. But you know, at the time, I was really looking to get out of Australia, mm. and this was a perfect opportunity to come to China. So I paid for my own trip, and and I came to China, and and at least they kind of afforded me some hospitality once I was here and, and took part in the shows and was, oh, was an honoured guest. And, you know, the <laughs> fact that I was here, they at least made a show of it and that was cool, nice. Cool. So so my first – I arrived in Beijing in 2005 uh, for my first uh, 10 days and uh, my the exhibition took place at 798 which is kind of where the UCCEA is now. It's like the one where the, the Bowie exhibition is Okay, right I'm not now. familiar with Beijing that way. So, so in 798, seven there's a David Bowie exhibition on right now, Mick Rock exhibition, and it's mm. it's the one with the big curved kind of uh, concrete Bauhaus sort of architecture. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was exhibiting right in there, which wow. is, is becoming- Was it a new building now, at that time or was it a- It was an old building. I mean, mm. it was the, an old armaments factory. I'm not familiar with the building at yeah. all. So. so 798, the whole area used to be kind of a big factory and oh, wow. armaments. And, and now it's, it's massive, transformed into like kind of an arch district or- Oh yeah. I mean, mm. 798 is, it's kind of like, just, if you go to Beijing, you just got to go there. It's sort of okay. like a- it's like an arts wonderland. In fact, I was there two weeks ago and I just couldn't believe how much it's changed. Wow. It's, it was a sunny day, so everything was bright and glossy and everyone was out and, and the sun was shining and there was no <laughs> pollution and it was mm. like beautiful and lots That's of awesome. people taking photos of themselves and lots of people taking photos of other people taking photos of themselves. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, you're at 798. You're, you're, um, you're showing off your stuff and the next stop is Shanghai? Next stop is Shanghai. And uh, so I arrive in Shanghai and all of a sudden I'm like, what language are they speaking here? It was all Shanghainese. And, mm. and even when I arrived in Beijing, I'm like, what language are they speaking here? And I'm like thinking Bruce Lee films and getting ready to hear a little bit of Cantonese. And right. I totally like didn't click the whole difference between Mandarin and, and Cantonese. Mm. So so it was a quick, for, quick... For people who don't know, can you explain what the difference between Mandarin well, and Cantonese is? Well, um, technically Cantonese has 12 sounds for every syllable, every wow. every way, and Mandarin really has, has only four. So mm. it's a little bit simpler. Um the characters, uh, there's two character sets. Mandarin is a simplified character set. Uh, Cantonese is the traditional characters, mm. which have got m typically many more strokes. Right. Uh, you can sort of recognise a few characters, uh, but but the government made a very smart move many many decades ago in simplifying yeah. the Chinese language. It's so and interesting how the how a government can make a decision on a cultural thing like so strongly. Mm. I, I, I was, when I heard that, it's like, cause it got me thinking like, how does one manipulate like a language like that? And the government was just able to make that decision. I thought that was really cool and strong. <laughs> well, they're good at making unilateral manipulative decisions. Mm -hmm. So, so they do that well here. Sure. And, uh, um, so the difference is, and then in the north, they're speaking with like a very kind of northern accent, and everything kind arr, of ends arr, in arr, arr, arr. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like a bunch of seals at SeaWorld. <laughs> and uh, and then you get to Shanghai, and people like throwing out their words like "vegetable," you know, it's all sort of like you don't even understand it. Even mm. now, it's a completely different language. Sure. And uh, I've actually just started Shanghainese lessons. Awesome! Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah Fully yeah. focused just, on Shanghainese. Uh, yeah, got a got a got a uh, old IE. She comes in once a week. That's and, awesome. Uh, the idea. I just learned one bit of Shanghainese the other day. Instead of henhao, they say like haihao. I don't know if you know that. Luo hao. Luo hao. Really? Luo hao. Luo hao. Mm. Oh, okay, maybe I got it wrong. But maybe he doesn't even speak Shanghainese. Maybe it's a different dialect. It's so insane. Like when I first learned that that. Um, the dialects are so different all across China. It kind of blew my mind because, you know, maybe 100 or 200 years ago, people that were 100 kilometers away couldn't communicate with each other. Now that they have this, like, unifying language, it's changing the game for yeah. how China's going to operate in the future. Yeah. 
It's That's pretty, right. And now they got WeChat. You just press the translate button. Oh my God. Yeah. The translate button is a lifesaver. Um, okay. Let's, let's get a little more back to. So I got Shanghai. to Shanghai and they're speaking a different language and I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> and, uh, but I had a friend here. Um, a, a new friend that someone had just introduced when uh, they found out I was going to China. And he's like, yeah, come stay with me. i got a spare room. So a uh, buddy of mine, Todd, who's pretty much been, um, uh, you know, my closest ally in the, in, in the fight. And uh, I stayed with him for a few weeks in Shanghai and uh, had a pretty good time. And I thought, well, this is this is where I want to be. It was pretty mm-hmm. raw back then. Like the only Starbucks was down in Shintendi and wow. you know, none of, none of this existed. Yeah, right really now we're nice. sitting in, uh, we're sitting in Lao Ximin right now and there's a ton of buildings around us. We're sitting in my office and beautiful site. And Rodney's saying there was nothing around this area. You said this was like also like just flat factory zone kind of, or no, not quite that. I mean, some of these buildings certainly would have been there, but, but you know, if you go closer to Shintendi and all these beautiful new buildings, like it was a lot of old houses and mm. old lanes and Shikaman houses. Right. and a couple of old factory compounds mm. and stuff. And Shanghai in general, they moved all the factories out of the center of town. Pretty quickly, but, as soon as they realized it was popping off. But even area. down near, near the board, near, near the South Bund, all that area was just all factories. I mean, wow. we used to go to warehouse parties down there. And, That's uh, so awesome. Yeah, and think. now it's all like bike paths and landscaping and mm. coffee coffee carts. The city has flipped overnight, basically. It's good. They've done a great job. Uh, it's beautiful. I mean, you go to America and, you, you know, you get the subway in America and you're like, what is this third world country? You Literally, know, you the New York, York subway. And, is a third world and it's amazing country. it's a miracle and obviously you know they've really focused on that mm. and they've done a good job and the government said this is what we're going to do and they've done it mm-hmm. and uh it's 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 amazing and the population embraces it mm, definitely they, they definitely embrace it and like it's amazing how the country is changing from i think you would call it an agrarian culture to now these massive cities just popping up all out of nowhere and I honestly think as much as people want to give like at a hard time, they're doing a very good job dealing with a population of 1.4 billion people and trying to make something out of it. Um, so you're in Shanghai. At what point did you leave? Um, at like to go back to Australia or did you stay so, for a while? So I came to this first trip was a one month exploratory fact finding mission. And, uh, so Beijing, Shanghai and did a cruise up the Yangtze with a mate as well. Hmm. And, uh, and and then went back to Sydney and I thought, that's it, I'm moving. So the plan was, and I'd met a few people while I was here on that first trip. I thought, right, I'm going to come back six months later. Yeah. And I came back for, for a few more weeks and stayed with another friend and uh, got my first job, which was a shoot for three on the Bund, which was nice back then. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of. So you moved here at that point? Well, I came for another month. Oh, for another like maybe, maybe month or like. Uh, what, no, like, no, it was pretty much, kind of- it was just another month to kind of suss some, some things out and okay. just kind of work it out and mm-hmm. try to get the ball rolling and sure. make contacts and yeah and then, do networking i guess and set then, yourself up yeah and then and then the plan was in january i would move for good wow and january, this is of 2006 this is 2006 hmm. um so you move here in 2006 what yeah. was that like so i moved i moved here and uh i was just about to move here and then i kind of got landed a big job in sydney so it delayed <laughs> me and uh and and then finally made it up and it was great. I mean, 2006 to, to 2008, it was the lead up to the Olympics. So right. there was a Things lot of building. a lot of energy in China mm. and everyone was excited. And then, you know, up to 2010 was the expo. So for those five years, it was all about, hey, we're on stage. It's mm. all happening, big events. And yeah. the world was coming to China for these global events. Mm. Uh, aside from that, brands were coming. Everyone was coming. And, and, you know, you could just go around town like seven days a week drinking champagne for free. It was just because <laughs> so many events. Non-stop stop events and wow. uh and it was kind of crazy for a while hmm. and um you move here your plan is to freelance start up your company because you you have a company in in australia like a small business yeah but i wasn't re- the plan wasn't really to to kind of bring that over here and as a freelance photographer the company was really a structure in which to operate hmm. um I'm not the kind of company that i have now and uh you know, to be honest, I didn't really have like a strategy. The plan was definitely to come here and work mm. and and things went well and got a couple of nice jobs and things sort of got off to a good start. And at the same time, in between work, 
you know, as, as a photographer, you know, when the jobs come in, they come in, but you have a lot of downtime. So mm-hmm. I really made an effort to learn the language. Okay. Uh, as a freelancer, I wasn't working in a company. My friends were all in companies. They had people speaking English and or, oh, people, yeah. or people to speak Chinese for them. So I had to kind of do things on my own. So mm-hmm. I made an effort to learn the language early. And uh, at the same time, I I traveled a lot. I traveled a lot around China and was shooting a bit of a series, personal series, mm. uh, shooting a portrait series around uh, tourist locations around China. Cool. And, and uh, sort of culminated in an exhibition in 2009 and that was right about the time that I was opening the studio. Mm. And so, oh, 2009 is when Central Studios. Yeah. Central, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's our 10-year uh, yeah. celebrating Congratulations, it's yeah. big. It's a nice milestone. So, um, yeah, I mean the plan to open Central Studios, uh, I, th- I think – I've always been in love with big spaces and in those early years we used to go around to these old warehouse buildings and, mm. and dream, oh, this would make a great studio and this yeah. would be good and and we kind of never really did anything and then kind of stuff started to move and and uh, in 2008 I was working with my then um, manager, agent at the time to help her build up her, her agency mm. and uh, we were going to open a studio together. And then the financial crisis came, yeah. the GFC, and uh, and uh, affected so, the whole world. It's crazy. Yeah, so we kind of said, okay, well, let's just not do it now. It's all a bit weird, and uh, we put the plans on hold. And we were working in the same building, and then um, and then about a year later, we just had a big party at my house. Um, me and my friend Todd, we our birthdays are close together, so we had a big Arabian Nights party. Mm, and that's awesome. Up on the rooftop, and everyone came as like sheiks and belly dancers and mm. hostages and uh, terrorists, and, <laughs> and it was a lot of oh fun. My God. And, yeah, and uh, so the next day we're drinking mojitos on the deck, and uh, we're kind of you know the call comes through, going, "Look, you should take this. You should take the space. It's gonna, it's gonna go. You mm. should really open the studio." And give so, you a big push. So I really... kind of looked at Natasha, my partner, and uh, we said, "Well, what are we doing in China if we don't do anything big?" So mm. we thought, all right, let's do it. And we had the plans all ready to go because we were going to do it. Um, we had it on ice, mm-hmm. so everything was kind of set up to go from the year before, and we kind of knew how to work the space and. Uh, we just kind of got in there and did it. It's we awesome. just said, let's do it. We signed the lease. And so it was three months, you know. Three-month lease or three-month process? Three-month build. So from the moment we signed the lease to the moment it was finished was was three months. And all of a sudden, you know, we opened the doors and it's like, hey, shit, we're, we're open. Hey, we better go and do some marketing. You know, it's <laughs> like it just – because we'd spend all that time focusing. Wow, We yeah. built it and designed it ourselves and we were pretty much on site every day and that did wonders for my Chinese, talking to builders. Oh, wow, yeah. And, and it's, uh, the, it's the – you know what's interesting? It's also the words you need to be learning too. Well, it's you, great you, for production. Yeah, you, know, you can stuff we do. You can go to university and learn the general language, but then you're going to have to w- learn the ling- like technical, you know, language. the vocabulary yeah. of your business. So if you're learning it in that environment, it's only going to benefit you tremendously for business, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're you're building the studio, like you're learning the language with like local builders. What was I mean? Like that's just fascinating to me. Yeah, it was good. It was good. It was frustrating, but uh, you know they moved fast, and you know it got to the point where we're literally drawing plans on the wall, or we we turn <laughs> up and they're like, okay, so how do you want to do this corner? We're like, okay, just draw it on the wall and mm. do it like this. Uh, it was a great process, and we were very hands on, mm. and uh, it um, yeah. So we opened the doors, and and all of a sudden we had the business. Awesome. Um, so the, the business is opening and, and you talk about like learning the Chinese culture. I want to talk to you about like, how much do you feel that you've actually learned the Chinese culture? Like I myself, I've been here for almost five years and some days I feel I really understand the culture and then other days I feel completely lost. So what, what do you think about that in terms of, you know, daily life or doing business? Like how, how uh, keyed into the culture are you? I think there are just so many levels to the culture that um, I'm always learning something new. Mm. Um, obviously, I'm sensitive to the culture, you know, in 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 business and uh, and daily life. Uh, we live in a in a in a local laneway, and on one level, in terms of daily life, shit just happens the mm. way it happens, yeah. and you get used to the fact that someone's going to be building right next to you on a Sunday. <laughs> yeah. You know, you get used to the way that the garbage works. You get used to the the people, you know, 
coming in, picking up and rifling through all your garbage and, mm. you know, all of that kind of stuff you become a bit impervious to and that's just the way it is. And you be- even become a bit sensitive and work to it. It's like you want to throw out some stuff, just here's the garbage guys, you know. Yeah. Um, but on a cultural level, like it's fascinating because there's so much symbolism like about how to do things and obviously face, mienza, mm. is, a, is a big thing. And so when doing business there's, I think, you know, us in the West, we just come right out and say shit. Mm. You know, you want to you wanna talk about a deal or you want to yeah. do things a certain way. You know, you come out and say I'm party shit. A, you're party B. It's very Pretty on much. Paper. But here there's a lot of stuff that you can't say and there's a lot of stuff that you need to be sensitive to um, giving people the right face mm. and, and doing things a certain way. Yeah. So I'm fortunate that I've got some good people in the company who who make sure that we don't make stupid mistakes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we definitely I, – I don't make unilateral decisions and, and I work with the team to, mm. to deal with some issues. Sometimes I'm a little bit like, this is bullshit, come on, you can't <laughs> we just do this and, you know, throw my arm, arms up in the air and huff and puff but, you know, I calm down and, and face the reality of where we're at and I think the thing that, that governs me is that at the end of the day I'm a guest in this country. The country's been good to me. We're mm. lucky that we've built a company and uh, – uh, been able to bring up a family and, and live well in Shanghai. So, you know, I'm very grateful to the time I've spent here and uh, it's it's something that I just have to be sensitive to. You know, I think it's very easy to to blast the government and when things don't go the way we want it to go mm. as Westerners and, and, you know, certainly the past couple of years things have changed but um, at the end of the day it's their prerogative and this is where we're at Definitely. and we've just got to work in the system. Definitely. I, I would agree with you. Um, whenever I get frustrated living in China, I always come back to the fact that I'm a guest here and I have, um, I have no permanent residence. It's, it's up to me to kind of assimilate to the culture. And when you can take a step back and learn about it and use it as a learning experience, it, it helps me grow every day and just kind of become a better person, I think. Um, inter- you once mentioned in an interview that... Um, a global campaign wouldn't work here in China. And I think you, I have a marketing background. I think over time you've developed a marketing background just by working with agencies. So I wanted to talk a little bit about like how special of, like it's kind of perfect timing. There's this book called Outliers I've read actually, I think by Malcolm. Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, sure. Great book. And it talks about how, um, you know, Luck is a big factor when it comes to success. So I think you were like in the perfect timing when all these brands are flowing into China. So I want I want to talk about how lucky you are in a sense that you were getting to create brands for China with global brands. Um, yeah, I mean, look, we, we've worked with amazing brands here and, and I have to say that, I mean, I think if I was in Australia, I just wouldn't get the opportunity to work with these Mm. brands. Just either they're not shooting the stuff there are in Australia or it's just too small a market or too, too hotly contested. And Mm. we have been here and, you know, we're a trusted brand in, in, in production here and, uh, it, it works well for us. I think the localization thing uh, there are a couple of ways to go about it. I mean, on one hand, there's there's global campaigns and people sure. say, hey, we want to localize this, which means putting Chinese faces in it, the same idea, and we just need to shoot it with local people for mm. the Chinese market. Yeah, uh, That's one thing, assuming that the message will hold here. Mm. And then there's other things where um, there's a global idea, but then they need to shift the creative a little bit mm-hmm. for the local market. Um, but Sometimes the ideas just don't translate here and yeah. the local officers want to do a completely different campaign. Mm. So it doesn't, it doesn't always work. Mm-hmm. Uh, they kind of really need to assess, you know, every brand is different and sure. what the message is. But, but definitely the interesting thing I think for me is, is more in visual style. Mm. You know, we create images, we create videos. So what's hot overseas, the kind of photography style that might be really hot in, in America or, or in Europe doesn't necessarily translate here. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, we did a shoot yesterday with a celebrity and and at the end of the day the images are going to be beautiful and glossy and retouched and, and you know, she's going to look like a goddess, which she is. <laughs> and and uh, But that's what the people want to see here. Yeah. So, you know, the kind of portraits, you know, really impactful campaigns in the West where you might have real people or elderly people or, you know, stuff that's just a great creative idea mm. and, and presenting a brand in a new light or a new a new a new 
style or message just might not work here because mm. the population is they see a lot of things at face value and and, mm. and don't really look at the the kind of the depth and the reality and the authenticity of those images. Yeah. And and sort of where they're seeing images is looking at, you know, there's a little bit of face value and, and they just have a different visual language. They have mm. a different visual semantics that they're dissecting the image in different ways. So what we think is is a good idea, they're like, no, that's a bit weird. And we, we see that internally. <laughs> like even when 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 me and Natasha we want to uh, present creative ideas about our studios or fair day or how we want to set something up, we always run it by the team and right. they give us their idea and they're like, but if we do it like this, that I think I see that. And it's hmm. like, well, that's not what we want you to see. It's like, no, 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 Chinese people won't see that. Really? So uh, Yeah, that's so that's it's very wise of you to have like almost a checks and balances. You know, you have your Western team and your Eastern team and, you know, you're, you're collaborating to make sure it's an event that works for both people. Um, I want to bring up the story of, I believe it's Dolce & Gabbana. Are you familiar with what, what happened with them? They did a campaign to, for Fashion Week and they had- Yeah, it was great news for a while. <laughs> it was it's crazy. Juicy. It was crazy yeah. news. So, um. Have you ever done any campaigns that kind of just like get nixed even after they're produced? Like maybe you're excited about to see what happens because what's really cool about your position is that you're kind of just facilitating the environment in which these creatives can work. You don't, you actually don't have any, um, you know, uh, re, uh, like not reliability, like accountability for what happens after the fact, um, in terms of PR. So I want to know your thoughts on the Dolce & Gabbana situation. It's a pretty straightforward thing. It was crazy. Um, and then also working with brands and maybe not be like seeing it just play out totally wrong. Mm. Um, yeah, well, the Dolce and Gabbana situation was, was a little bit ridiculous, really. I mean, it was just badly handled mm. and, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the creative thing, it's funny. I mean, the whole thing eating, firstly, I thought the creative was a little bit stupid and, and moronic <laughs> anyway, but I also thought the reaction was a little bit exaggerated. Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, every other culture can poke fun at themselves and the problem is, um, you know, Chinese people are just very uh, cautious about when mm. other people poke fun at them. Mm. So they often react a little bit differently. Um, but then the, the brand handled it badly. I think I think what's... Terribly. Yeah, <laughs> but then what's significant is just how fast and and and, and stuff can can blow up online and i'm sure that there are armies of people here who are just ready to pounce on that kind of stuff mm. but you know it happens in the west as well and you know that's the that's the that's the world we live in with with the power of the media and stuff so i mean i have we haven't really been in a situation where we've done campaigns that have been nixed because of those kind of aesthetic or cultural reasons mm. i mean we we had an interesting case recently we did a shoot and, and it was nixed just because like Someone else in well, I, someone else in the company might have wanted to use the idea, mm. and so so all of a sudden the idea pops up elsewhere and uh, super political issue. Yeah, it's kind of like, hang on, ooh, that's a bit weird, and it was supposed to go one way, but then someone else took it. So that kind of stuff, but but that's internal politics, and mm. it's nothing. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I want to know a little bit more about the business behind Central Studios because you yourself, like, you get to travel a lot. Um. You got, you said you're like uh, basically first and foremost, just a photo and video studio where people get to do what they want. But do you also do campaign work? Do, yeah. Like you, so you do, like you have a team that does the creative behind that. Yep. Uh, how involved with, are you with that stuff? Um, yeah. So the creative, it's really funny. You know, you talk about life before being creative. I, I don't, I, I, sometimes I feel very non-creative right now. Mm. Like, you know, running the business, it, it's kind of a full-time job in itself. And I'm sort of at the point where I actually don't really want to be doing creative because I'm not really in a creative headspace. I'm worrying about the business too much. I'm trying to keep the business growing and mm. uh, and and keeping the keeping the train on the tracks. Um, so we work with creatives. Um, we have some creative in house, or we get freelancers, and uh, so part of that is is just really tailoring the team to whatever the clients need. Mm. Uh, we've just done the, the shoot yesterday was a, was a fashion luxury uh, campaign. So we worked with a creative who was definitely geared towards that end of the market. But then, you know, you work with other brands or, or um, something a bit more street. You need to work with someone that's going to get that a little bit more. Mm. Uh, but we, we're at the point where we're now 
can can definitely do creative and offering creative campaigns. And mm. I think it's more a reflection of uh, the flux in the industry. Mm. Brands don't really want to go direct to advertising agencies anymore and they're looking for production who can do creative and <laughs> rather than commit to annual retainers or agency on records, what's happening now is everything's very much more project-based. Mm. So we get an opportunity to to just take on these projects and that means doing the production and uh, doing the creative and, and doing the full delivery. So it's a great space to be and it, it's, it's kind of past couple of years that started to become a little bit more important to us. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely completely foreign and I, I can't really imagine a world where you have a, like a year-long retainer with one brand. Like my experience working at a media house where it was always project by project. I, I've never experienced a situation where you, you have that kind of job security with a client. Um, what do you feel? That it takes a, on a, I mean, it brings on a whole new level of management. There's a lot of account management yeah. uh, that you need to take on. And so, you know, you don't necessarily get paid for that because it's a project base. They just expect you to be on call. That's what I hate about so, it. So in me. the end, you, you know, what might seem like a much bigger budget or a bigger slice of the pie, once you weigh up all the time and effort needed to, to massage that relationship, uh, it doesn't really work out mm. that that advantageous. However, if you don't do it, you just don't get the work. So, you know, I think it's part about budgets are going down and it's tougher brands want to do more for less, you know, with, with social media and especially in China with 618, uh, with 1111, with all of these online shopping days. Now brands just need to be churning out so much content mm. and the budgets aren't going up. So they're trying to squeeze as much out of every shooting opportunity. And then of course they're paying a celebrity. So they need to milk as much out of that day of shooting because the celebrity is on set. So you, you're pulling out all of these assets and uh, I guess that's where we we kind of can can excel a bit because we've got a lot of in-house services and we can mm. kind of really help to to just produce a lot of that directly. Yeah. Do you like being a boss? Do I like being a boss? Uh, well, it's kind of nice. You know, you walk in the door and it's like, hi, boss, hi, boss. <laughs> um, but look, it's, it's nice to own something. Um, do I sometimes I wish I could just like not – do any of that shit yeah. and just shoot and, hmm. you know, do stuff. But I guess for me, I'm sort of just trying to work out really where my sweet spot is and, and in terms of management or what kind of boss do I want to be yeah. and, and and what work do I want to be doing. You know, I still get pulled into a few productions from time to time and uh, and, and I don't mind that. It's nice to be on set but, but then it pulls me away from other things. Hmm. So ideally, you know, I can kind of really – just work on, you know, Central Studios 2.0 and work on mm. where we need to be in, in yeah. the next 10 years. Yeah, because, okay, so the title of this show is Observing the Process, if you don't know. And for me, I'm, I try and learn from all my guests, like, I say the story every time. So it, everyone has a destination, like where they want to be. They have a goal. And maybe, like, right now you're thinking only about the goal. But for me, I feel that you need to love the process of getting to that goal and right now from this conversation, I'm getting a little bit like you're, you're not in a creative headspace. It's like, you're just focusing on your job as a boss. So I, I just want to like dive more deeply into like, are you reevaluating your process of like what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Or is that something you think about even? Look, absolutely. That's definitely part of it. And, uh, it's after 10 years of, of running the business, um, we, you know, we definitely are having the conversations about, well, where does the, the next where, 10 yeah. years go? Hmm. And things have changed so fast, you know, even in the past five years. Yes. Like from when we started the business, we were, we were the first kind of high-level studio You have that in stamp Shanghai. on your website and it's damn true. Yeah. Like, it, so, true. So, so when we started 10 years ago, um, it was kind of like a, you know, blue ocean kind of space. And the industry has developed a lot. And uh, – on one hand, you've got the industry that's developed a lot. There's a lot more studios now. Production companies are sophisticated. There's great people, great professionals working out there. Um, but then the market's changed. Mm. Social media, the nature of content has changed. The nature of content delivery has changed. Mobile phones, the iPhone, there's, it's all just happened. You can do a campaign on a yeah. phone. It's insane. Exactly. So, uh, which we've done. So, <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of like, well, well, where, what's our place in all of this? Mm. And, uh, we're, we're certainly evolving 
um, we haven't clearly identified the destination, mm. uh, but but the conversations are being had about you know sort of where um, where the business will develop, and um, it's it's exciting. And I think for me now, I'm I'm starting to embrace that challenge, mm. and that's something that now I want to turn my my attention to uh, focus on full time. Mm. And uh, you know the team does such a fantastic job of running the company that you know I'm I'm blessed that I can actually try to step away a bit and just get some space and, and work on that a little bit. That That's great to hear. I'm, I'm glad you're planning for the future. Um, speaking about work and relaxing, like what is your thought on, you know, taking time to recharge the batteries, getting out of the city? I think I read you have a place in Jujiaozhou. Is that correct? We had a place. Had, okay. Yeah. I thought it might've not still been yours, but tell me about that. I just want to dive into like- So that was fun. Look, that was a rental. We didn't own it. And oh. uh, a friend of mine had opened up a cafe out there on the on the river. He's like, come out and check it out. We're renting this 2000 RMB a month. So we went out and <laughs> drank tea and and he's like, come check this out. This is available and this is available. So we saw this house. We thought, well, this is cool. So we took it. It was a little bit off the lake, but it was a big old house and- uh, and big yard out the back. And so we did a little renovation on it and took a long lease on it. And mm. uh, we ended up renting it for, for five years. And uh, it was great. But unfortunately, we didn't go there that much. So How far away is it? It's like, an it's, hour. It's, it's a water Jujo town. town. It's you, a water town. But look, there's a subway there now. I mean, you can get the metro there. I, yeah. I think it's opened. And it is open. So basically, we took we took the house. And the idea was it would be our getaway. Mm. But the problem was that we'd get out there and you'd spend the first you know couple of hours cleaning up. We'd finally relax. And then you have to pack up to come back the next mm. day and we finally got it sorted we got the gardener we had the ie we had the caretaker we had you know we had everyone had all the staff out there that to to look after the house so we mm. stuck it up on airbnb and, and the whole thing was working nicely mm. and we never really made money on it but at least it helped uh cover the cost of it all yeah it's like a free and it was great so we'd go out there a couple of times a year and max would love it and he'd go running through town max is our son and and Typically, the, the old lanes of, of Jujajau, everything is, it's kind of tourist central, right? Mm. They've got lots of crappy kids stores selling lots of landfill and plastic and it's all like about 60 centimetres off the ground. Mm. So the little kids are running through and it's right at their eye line. And <laughs> so every every third shop he'd stop and wanted to buy some bit of plastic and he loved it mm. and I hated it. So I, I'd go there <laughs> I'd go there, and I just didn't want to leave the house but he just wanted to go exploring through the town. Huh. And so we'd go on walks. But what was beautiful about this house was – We'd get there and we'd close the front doors and we'd draw the curtain, which would just block the windows. And it was our little private sanctuary in the yeah. yard and it was silent. And at night it was deadly quiet except for a couple of dogs barking. Mm. So, and it was really peaceful and we'd get a beautiful sleep out there. And uh, it was quite charming. We'd, ha we'd have barbecues in the yard and then come back. And then the problem was coming back. So we'd come back and once, yeah. as soon as you hit Hong Chao, you're sitting in traffic for an hour on a Sunday mm. afternoon. So you would drive. Yeah, we drove. And... Uh, it was a lot of work, and then the kind of straw that broke the camel's back was uh, we had a we had an Airbnb, and and I knew the landlord was kind of looking to sell it and stuff, and but we had a tenant in there, an Airbnb guest, and I'm in New York at the time, and I get a call from this French lady, and she's like, "Look, we are here, and and you, you know, I should have sensed that." this might have been a problem because her emails in the lead up were like, we just want to get there and we want to have a rest and we just want it to be perfect. And mm. I'm like, oh no, it's Jiu Jiao and it's, a, it's they an don't old even house. know what they're getting into. Yeah. It's, it's an China. old house. Like, it's China. You, you like, don't know. Yeah. It's they just, just don't like, know. they're going to, it's not like this villa on the, in, in, in Provence. And so, so basically anyway, so they get there, they got a car straight from Pudong. They've just done this long haul flight and they get there and they stay in the house. And, um, and basically she calls me and says, look, someone's just come in to show people the house. I said, oh, oh shit, I'm really sorry. Like I knew an agent had a key, right? Mm. But like they're supposed to contact our caretaker and yeah, let them in and notify them. that's China. That's so they China. just come in. I said, let me make a call. Look, I'm really sorry about that, right? And she and it was kind of like, you know, kind yeah. of clenching my, my She's fears. ready to flip a switch. Well, probably. she was all right. And I said, look, I'm really sorry. Anyway, so a couple of hours later, um, <laughs> I get a call, it's the middle of the night there, and she's like, the dog's barking. And I said, look, it's, 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 it's a dog. It's a what dog. do you want me to do? Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> said, New York I, said, I said, look, you know, I, you could tell the dog to be quiet, but the mm. dog only speaks Chinese. And, uh, <laughs> what did she have to say? Oh, my she God. She didn't quite get the humor. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, the next morning, so the next morning I get another call and another agent has shown some other people oh through the house. Lord. And I'm like, oh, fuck, this is it. I said, don't worry. Listen, you're getting your money back. Don't worry about a thing and just don't, don't just sledge leave. me on Airbnb. Just, <laughs> yeah. just try not to leave me a bad review. I'll sort it out. 
this is really unexpected. Yeah. So after that, we just went in and said, you know what, take the house back. And they were trying to sell it to me. And cute old couple that owned it. I mean, they really had nothing. And they, li- they lived in Shanghai and they're just huh. trying to, you know. It was they just like had a little something. Well, the whole compound it? was like a family and they'd split it up between all the sons and cousins and stuff. Hmm. So, you know, you could see the guy that lived there was trying to angle. Her. I always thought it was his house, but it was actually his cousin's house. And you never really knew the full story. He was trying to sell it to me so he could make his cut and I don't know. It would have been nice to buy. It probably wouldn't have been a bad investment. But right. just kind I'm of thinking now as, yeah. as the city is expanding, you know, Zhuzhou is only going to become a more like pop in place for relaxing. Yeah, and- yeah but it's, it's tourist heaven. And in the end, it was just all a bit, I just thought it was a bit expensive for what it was. But mm. then, you know, you say that about everything and then look, shoulda, woulda, coulda. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. Is the place like, I, I think you just described this before, but is it like a city vibe or is it like it's on the Jijia water? Jiao. No, look, I don't, I've never been there. Um, so it's it's like the, you you you'd be doing well to call it the Venice of Shanghai, but <laughs> it's it's a bunch of kind of quite fetid brown water canals. Mm. A lot oh, of the, with like uh, the little like yeah. I mean, it's charming. You look yeah. at it on a beautiful day; it's charming. On a grey day, it's a little bit grim, but. But they're nice towns and it's charming with all the architecture, but there's a lot of mozzies and a lot of tourists and a lot of people poking mm. their head, you know, their head in your business. And it's it's so just, not the getaway exactly. It's really. not the getaway. And yeah. it's not like, you know, your nice little country mountain retreat. Mm. So we kind of gave it up. I thought, you know what, I'd rather just get out of China when I got time off. I'd actually rather just be staying at home. Because we work so hard that we've <laughs> yeah. got a nice house and 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 just use it here. <laughs> I just, you know what, I just want to chill at home. Yeah. You know, and hang out with a kid and mm-hmm. to get in the car and go somewhere. It's just such a hassle it does sound like a dream but it adds this whole layer of travel it's a lot of work the holiday yeah. house is a lot of work like even my girl and i my, my girlfriend fooled in we went to uh mogunshan for the first time i think yeah like for dragon boat festival oh my god the the traffic like in the, the to get out from hong chow and all the people that are traveling at that time it traveling in china is worse than traveling internationally like flying out at pudong is a dream compared to having to go to the to the uh to the hongqiao like train station make all these transfers and then you get in the cab and uh, i wanted to talk to you a little bit about like i don't consider shanghai to really be china i think shanghai is like a very special part of china and can almost be its own little thing like once you leave the outer like the, the third ring it's just different. So what are your thoughts on just China versus Shanghai, I would say? Yeah, I mean, it's like any any big cities like New York and LA, it doesn't, is that really representative of America? Clearly not. Maybe not. But for me, what I'm getting at is like, if I do a road trip across America and I'm in New York and I'll, I'll find, you know, gas stations that will have what I need. When you leave Shanghai, it's just a different world. Like the gas stations are bare bones of what you need. The food, like there's zero resources for Western food out there. And maybe I sound like a privileged, like foreigner, whatever. That's the way I feel. Well, that's because there's really very few Westerners going there. Mm. So um, it's all relative, isn't it? I mean, it's it's uh, if, if there were enough Westerners going there, you'd find the Western food because someone would work out how to make a buck from it. Right. But But, but what I'm more getting at, it's, it's just like, so bare bones. It's probably the truth is probably, I just don't know how to navigate that land or speak the language fully yeah, no, enough to right. get the I mean, food I want. Yeah. I mean, it, it's local and uh, you get out there and, and it's, it's, it's local. There isn't the wealth mm. and uh, it's kind of, you just look at the demographics mm. and, and whatever's out there caters to whatever demographic, like you go to Fair Second enough. or third tier cities, like even you go to Shaman or, mm. or Qingdao or Hangzhou, or, you know, and, and these kind of smaller but significant cities, you're going to find Western restaurants. You're going to find an option to get what you need. It's true. And it's kind of where the development is. Um, mm. But, I mean, if you're going anywhere between those towns, of course, it's it's massively local and it it's there's no need for it to be Western. Completely agree. Not, I'm not, not, I'm not in- complaining about how it's Western. I'm I'm like – making an observation that I, I feel like it's just kind of limiting sometimes, like just even like the resources that you have. And it kind of makes me appreciate so much about what we have in mm. Shanghai. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm fortunate that I get to travel around the country a little bit for work. Mm. Um, but typically when we go take vacations, I prefer to get out of China. Exactly. Um, yeah. And it, it's probably more just to also give my kid a little bit of an international um, mm taste of what's yeah, out that's there. funny that's next up on my list let's talk about raising a kid in china like what 
was that like your, I don't, for me, it wouldn't be my dream plan to raise a kid in, in Shanghai or China. So what has that experience been like? You know, you, you grew up with this amazing life in Australia. So do you, do you want to talk about that at all or? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that. Yeah. So look, I mean, firstly, raising a kid is amazing. Uh, mm. It doesn't matter where you are. I think anyone who has kids will agree that uh, it's it's an incredible journey. And mm. now that he's six, the conversations are fantastic. He's uh, um, he can read now. So what's nice is, you know, I get to the point where he's like, I'm bored or I'm bored, I'm bored. I'm like, well, work it out, son. And the next thing you look over and he's just reading a book and, uh, that, that takes a lot of pressure off that. He can become independent now and yeah. read stuff. And not only wow. that, you're like, just go down there to the, where it says exit or go out there to the ticket booth. And he's like, well, oh, there's ticket booth. And so, so it's amazing to see him get that independence through literacy. Mm. And, uh, and, and then of course he's bilingual. So, right. uh, typically he's up early and the IE comes, um, early and, and helps us in the morning. And, and the two of them are bantering in Chinese <laughs> and he's talking like a Chinese kid, like his accent is perfect. And, uh, it's amazing. And, to have a kid growing up in China, I actually think it's a real gift right now. Mm. Obviously there are sacrifices and obviously uh, we don't have the the nature and the environment that that I would prefer. Mm. Uh, on the weekends, our experiences are a little bit more limited to what we might have in Sydney mm. or, or other places. Um, so we compromise when you work it yes, out. Yes, it is a compromise. Um, I, I would completely agree that it's like when you weigh the pros and cons, like the world that we're moving into is so global. The advantages that your son is going to have being bilingual are amazing. I think it's, it's incredible. Yeah. I've always loved travel. I always loved the experience of, of, of moving around the world and, um, you know, short of being nomadic, but certainly being a bit of a rogue and, and, uh, and I think, you know, he's, he's had enough experience traveling already at his tender young age that I think it will probably be a part of him too. And I think it's a really important thing to have. I, mm. I think, you know, social networks online are so fluid, but mm. it's so important to have these kind of real life networks that are fluid right. between nations. And, yeah. uh, and I just want to really be intent on making sure he knows what reality is. Yeah. So setting up a foundation, does, does he go to an international school? I, I think the law is he must go to an international school. That's um, no, he's, he's going to, well, I, I'm a bit confused. He's going to school uh, called YK power. He will next year start at a new school, which oh, right, is because he must be in like kindergarten. Right he's now. going into elementary school okay. in September. Hmm. I, I get confused. I don't know if it's international or bilingual or a local bilingual or a local international bilingual, or there's mm. all these different classifications, yeah. but it, it's a local, I think it is, it, it is, on the local government system, but they have a okay. slightly different syllabus. Sure. Sure. So what, what has the experience been with like him and friends? Like he's learning the language. Like what, what does a, a kid do? Like go to parks here or what's the like play dates? We or? live next to a park on Shaoxing Lu. So he's at the age now where he's like, I want to go to Shaoxing park. And we just let him go downstairs by himself. Awesome. He'll take his bike and he rides. It's kind of all the, he was born in our lane. So mm. everyone knows him. The people in the park know him. He's, mm. he's, part of the furniture and you know as much as Chinese people like change they love things to be constant hmm. so part of that is like you know we're a part of the furniture we've been living in this house for 10 years and uh the neighbors it's a great community everyone yeah. keeps an eye out for him and if we need to go out or something and we can we can kind of leave him there with the neighbors for a little bit and and he's got the the kids in the lane are his best friends and he's got Chinese kids um local kids He's just equally comfortable playing with Chinese or, or foreign kids. It's yeah, great. he knows no different. It's, it's just it's just life to him. Correct. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. That's probably one of my favorite parts about China is just how safe. No, sorry, Shanghai. How safe of a city it is. Like in New York, I don't think you're really going to let your kid ride his bike down the street to the park. No way. Yeah. I mean, even in Sydney, you know, front doors locked and mm. and everything. It's you just wouldn't do it. I don't think people have that impression of Shanghai. They they have no idea how safe of a city this is. Yeah, what do you think? Do you think people no, really great. know? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess people who come to Shanghai, it's foreign. They don't speak the language. They don't mm. know what, you know, some, some local guy sticks his head in your business and what's he doing? But he's just curious. Yeah. And uh, it's not really that they want to form harm. I mean, Chinese mm. people are inherently very friendly and, right. and very warm, but they just – have a different way of expressing it. <laughs> so um, it's safe, yeah. I mean, uh, we feel really lucky that he's got to grow up here. And, mm. and the problem is that if we or if or when we move back to Australia or anywhere else, he's going to need to learn a whole new set of street smarts. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting in and of itself that he's he's culturally Chinese, probably more than he is anything else. He's yeah. Chinese. So moving to Australia, like, yeah, when do you think the move would happen? Uh, we don't know, but, I mean, we, we certainly would like to think about him being in high school in, in Australia, so mm. that's another five, six years. Mm. But So high school is the goal maybe. Maybe rough, yeah. like broad strokes, yeah. like yeah. high school. But he... Um, He's culturally Chinese, but he's also he knows what it's like to be Australian because he must we, have been there a bunch. Yeah, we have, beach, back hol- we have beach holidays in Australia. We go back all the time, so yeah. it's not like crazy. He's yeah. not going to like be dropped in the middle of nowhere. We have relatives in Canada, so we've also had the good fortune to to spend some time hmm. up in. So he's in an international Canada. kid. But yeah, and he's 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 kind of knows how to swim and get into nature, and yeah. so he's kind of getting getting good at all of that. Yeah, because like you hear about the term like ABC, like American born Chinese. And maybe there's a whole. He's a CBA. Is, it, is that what there's a term for it? Chinese born Australian. <laughs> you just made it up if there isn't. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, I, I think it's just interesting that like there's probably a whole herd of kids right now growing up that are just international kids. Yeah, it's awesome. There's this whole bunch of kids, all the mates and, you know, friends of our, our, our sort of social network. And they're amazing kids. They're all bilingual. Mm. They're all growing up in Shanghai. And he's going to have an awesome network. Yeah, I just, you're setting yeah. him up for success yeah. with that kind of well, stuff. I hope so, yeah. It's awesome. Moving on to a bit of traveling. Where Have you lived anywhere else besides China? Like this, like I know New York for a, a stint, like a year. Yeah, no, it was just New York and then um, Sydney, mm. New York, Sydney, here. Okay, but um, what about traveling? Like, what are what are some of your favorite places to travel outside of China and not Australia? Um, Europe. We've had a few visits to Ibiza in the summer, which mm. is fun. Yeah, I've never been. It's a good scene out there. Like beach life, or on the? Is it like beach, on the rocks? It's called beach or? club, beach clubs. Okay, and sort of the way it works there is you just kind of book a table at a beach club and hang out at the beach. Yeah, and, so super and relaxed. Eat good food, super relaxed. Mm. And, you know, beaches, boats, and parties. Although we don't really party that much but <laughs> it's certainly there if you want it um and then australia we, we we've uh we we booked a like a beach house in a little town a couple of hours south of sydney and just kind okay. of lobbed in there for a couple of weeks last mm. chinese new year and that's always nice we have friends in bali we've been to bali a few times um and then uh the other one is canada obviously my in-laws are where in canada, in canada. Um, around ottawa ottawa oh that's kind of yeah. in the center no uh, Not on a coast. It's smack bang in the sea. Yeah, towards the east. Toward, okay. Towards Montreal. Cold. Yeah. I've I've only been to Montreal. Montreal's a beautiful, beautiful Montreal's city. great. Yeah, I'm into Montreal. Yeah. Would you ever move to Canada? Well, I've talked about it, but not seriously. I mean, I, I'd consider it. I mm. like the Canadians. The Canadians <laughs> and Australians generally are quite similar. And, quite chummy. Yeah. That's pretty cool. He's got family there. He's got cousins there. It's, it's yeah. nice. Yeah. So the fam, what family is there again? My wife's sister. Oh, your wife's there. sister. Yeah. Well, that's something I wanted to talk about a little. You work quite closely with your wife. That's right? So Very closely. So not to get too personal, but, you know, I think that's an interesting topic, like working closely with, with your partner because my girlfriend and I are starting to work together and, you know, tension can arise. And I, from from the wise, I want to hear what's your advice on working with with your loved one. Yeah, I mean it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting side of our relationship, and uh, what's really interesting is that sometimes we're just working on completely different things. Hmm. So I might be just handling one side of the stuff, and she's doing something else, and and we're kind of so busy that we don't we probably don't really manage our time hmm. like having properly scheduled meetings instead we're kind of like talking about stuff over breakfast but then my phone's going or my brother's calling me from Sydney and you know you yeah. you always get these interruptions so we could probably do time management a little bit better and really scheduling like proper meetings to discuss mm. stuff but we kind of do stuff on the fly or we get home and we find we're talking about stuff and and then it's like <laughs> oh I don't want to talk about this now I want to just relax and yeah. so it's kind of um it's challenging yeah. definitely challenging but by the same token you know there's there's 100% trust and mm. you know I I, I I love what she does. She's incredibly creative and talented. And, you know, you talk about the creative. It's kind of one reason why I don't want to be creative because she's there. And I conflict with I just kind of, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to, you know, show her up with my uh, impressive uh, creative <laughs> talent. So I just let her take all the glory. But um, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're, we're very different people in the way we manage people and the way we approach things. Mm. So it's probably a good balance. That's cool. Yeah. Because I'm learning the, ins- and it's, 
also a question of just technology too, because like you're able to work from wherever. So like, do you ever turn work off? Do you have like a protocol of how you do that? Like for me, I can get lost in emails on my phone or, you know, Instagram is somewhat of a business for me. So how do you, you already mentioned like you're managing your time, but do you, would you agree with me? Like that it's somewhat of something to navigate these days. Yeah. I mean, I think if we're on holidays, we, we try and alert people appropriately mm. or, or pass on stuff to, to the, to the next person. Yeah. Um, but we've had, we've had times where I've had to cut a holiday short to get back to Shanghai for mm. a job or, or she has to, and occasionally it happens. And, um, or, you know, sometimes, you know, with fashion weeks and stuff, we're on holidays and she's busy prepping stuff before fashion week mm. and, and it happens to be over the October holidays. So the timing sometimes gets in the way. Mm. So I guess the advantage is that, you know, being owner operators, we can sort of take a holiday whenever. So if we need to be here for work or when everyone else is on holidays, we can just work. And then when the time is right, we just take a break. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Sounds like you're on a good path. Um, can we talk about, um, the fair that's coming up? It's yeah. this weekend. So like, tell me about that. It's at central studios. of yeah. course. Yeah. So, uh, the fair day is something that we started pretty much from the beginning. Mm. And, uh, I guess it's kind of like, we all grew up with flea markets or, mm. or local neighborhood markets and and there wasn't really anything like that in Shanghai. So we just started out by just all of our friends and all the stylists at the magazines and our friends that were working in luxury brands at the time say, come on down and just sell your wardrobe. And people yeah. were selling their own secondhand stuff. Okay. And then we started to get uh, a couple of other brands and young startups and some design stuff. And, mm. and it's kind of grown organically from there where now, you know, you got, we have a couple of vintage shops, uh, people like Helen Lee are coming down mm. and, um, you know, some of the great brands, Chair Eyes and some really great local Shanghainese brands uh, or local Shanghai brands are coming down to take part and have taken part over the years. But when I look back at some of those photos from the first year, it was kind of like such an empty thing. We just had a couple <laughs> of racks and it was really just our mates and it was a good time and, you know, we had some music. And But now it's kind of really grown into full production where That's this awesome. year we're, we're expanding it out into the yard oh, cool. and the management's let us kind of use some of the car park area and we've got DFO who have got a showroom next to her are going to join in and mm. uh, the, the guys from Yumi and Standard Nerds Club have come down to run a ping pong competition. Sick. And, uh, you know, we've got ice cream, egg, <laughs> uh, look, all the favourites, all the fair yeah. day favourites, um, some good drinks and food. That's awesome. I think for me and Pushfest this year, the goal was to have like the community involved. We didn't work with big brands. We worked with, uh, you know, Jingye and um, Peddler's Gin. So, you know, having that community be in an event is a really special thing for me. So it's cool to see that you've been doing that for the past 10 years. Mm. Yeah, no, it's great. And it's not really a profit driven day. Every, every, every time we do it, we always pick a charity. Mm. So even from, oh, the, awesome. yeah. So even from the first year where we didn't really have such a big turnout, we gave some money to Roots and Shoots, okay. uh, to, to stem the deforestation of Inner Mongolia. Mm. And, uh, and really for the past seven or so, seven or eight years, I think we've been working with the library project hmm. who do great things. What's and, the library and project? The library project is an organization that uh, basically builds libraries or reading corners in impoverished schools throughout rural China. That's awesome. So we've donated up, I think about nine libraries to date and uh, it's amazing. And you go out there and these kids are just so grateful to get these brand new uh, little colorful desks and, and, and bookshelves full of these books. Mm. And, uh, it's a great program and these, these schools really, they're very under-resourced. Mm. So it's an organization that helps education, helps educate the people. Mm. I was talking about this yesterday, like as I grow older and hopefully more wiser information is, is the biggest key to, to helping someone and helping them grow. There's, a, there's unfortunately a lot of charities that mean well, but for example, I heard, I don't know how true this is, but Oprah Winfrey has a charity that puts women through college in Africa, mm. but after they're done, they actually, they're educated, but the, the program is no longer available to them. They have no resources after the program. So there's these educated women in Africa who now, you know, almost have seen the light, but are taken back into the dark. That's, mm. that sounds terrible, but this program, it sounds like you're continually working to, to keep just providing education. Yeah. So, I mean, it's mainly primary school kids mm. as far as I know, and, uh, they just keep 
keep rolling them out. I mean, you think how many schools there are across China, and yeah. some of these are really hard to get to. Like you go, you go <laughs> on the, you go on the giving trip, and uh, it's like you know you got to fly for two hours, and you get a bus for six hours, and you swap to a van for three hours, and they're pretty remote schools. Wow. And uh, it, it, it's a great thing. So we're continuing that, and and that's our aim is to, is to donate um, all proceeds mm. uh, to to the library project. That's obviously, awesome. obviously the cost of production have gone up a bit, so we're we're grateful to have some sponsorship support from mm. from Beats by Dre, Doctor Dre, awesome, and um, who support a lot of our events. Yeah. and, and they're, they're into it. That's we're also doing something new, the Red Crate Project, Red Crate. which is we have. Uh, a whole lot of red crates and they're going to be numbered and the idea is that you come and take a little plastic red crate and take it home to mm. try to foster recycling in the house. Awesome. Me and my girlfriend are, have just started like getting separating into Separating the garbage and everything. Yeah, well, because you know it's a new law here. It's in a new law coming in that everyone's got to start separating the garbage. So yeah. what we're doing is saying, well, here's the thing. Because in, 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 in Australia, we've got like five different garbage bins. Huh. It's ridiculous. You've got this for the bottles and this for the plastic and that for the cardboard and that mm. for the dog poo. And <laughs> so... It's uh, it's something that we're going to say, hey, take it. And we want to kind of um, see where the red crates end up and follow how, how people are using that. So come along to the fair day and grab a red crate, register and, and share your red crate experience with us. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Rodney. This has been a great chat. Can you tell one more time how people can find out like information, like what's your Instagram, maybe the website they should go to if they want to sure, come? Sure. So Instagram is Central Studios and uh, website centralstudios.cn mm. and uh, you can find all the info there and then navigate your way to follow our WeChat and uh, mm. we're at 751 Huang Pinan Lu. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rodney. I'll Thank see you, you there. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Boom. That's it. Thanks so much for listening. I really am excited about how this podcast is turning out, but I can always improve. I would love to hear your feedback. If you want to reach out and suggest I talk about something specific or have a specific guest on, you can email me at shanghaiobserved at gmail.com. That is shanghaiobserved at gmail.com. Also, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by shanghaiobserved.com slash shop. That's right. I'm plugging my own shop. It means so much that people already buy my stuff. If you want to support me, you can go to shanghaiobserved.com and buy a shirt or whatever is on there right now. Uh, even if you buy a sticker, it, it really supports and helps me do what I love to do. I owe it all to you guys. Thank you so much for listening and supporting me. Thanks a bunch. Peace, guys. Also, if you enjoyed the intro and outro music, it was made by my brother, Danny Greenberg. You can go and check out his beats at soundcloud.com slash estoric, E-S-T-O-R-I-C. Okay, that's it for now. Peace.